Bonjour à toutes et à tous. C'est avec beaucoup de plaisir que je vous souhaite la bienvenue au Centre des études en politique internationale. Good morning and a very warm welcome to the Center for International Policy Studies and to our very first event of the academic year, a world in flux foreign policy for the next Canadian government. Je m'appelle Rita Abrahamson et je suis la directrice du CEPI. We begin, as we always do, with paying respect to the Algonquin people, who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their long-standing relationship with the territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to the Indigenous people in the region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honour their courageous leaders, past, present and future. As I mentioned, this is the very first event of SIPS of this academic year, and the topic of foreign policy for the next Canadian government could hardly be more important and more timely, given as we are in the midst of an election campaign. To moderate this debate, I am very pleased to welcome Madeleine Drohan. Madeleine Drohan is a senior fellow in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. And she's also uh, The Economist former correspondent in Canada. So Madeleine, a very warm welcome to you and I hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Abrahamson. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, especially with this uh, group of panelists. Um, as you, anyone that's been watching the uh, leaders debates on TV can see that foreign policy, you know, it's touched on from time to time, but it's usually in bits and pieces and usually used to score political points rather than to explore options for the next government. So that's what we're about today is fleshing out those options uh, in, in more detail Uh, for the government that's going to take office after the election. Uh, the way we're going to proceed is um, uh, I will ask the panelists a series of questions uh, to start off. That discussion uh, will take about an hour. Uh, the participants can ask questions at any time in the chat mode, but we're going to save those questions until the end Um, till that last 30 minutes, because some of the questions will probably be the same. Et uh, comme uh, c'est une conférence bilingue, uh, vous pouvez poser des questions en anglais ou en français. Uh, now, I'm going to introduce the panelists in alphabetical order. Their CVs are so long, their experience so vast that if I started to go through everything that is due to them, um, that would take up the rest of the conference. So I'm just going to give their primary affiliation uh, in these introductions, but I encourage people to go on the website and look at the, the full bios there. So joining us from Ottawa is Peter Beam, who is a Senator and is chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Trade. Welcome. Uh, Then we have Andrea, sorry, Andrea Charon, who's the director of the University of Manitoba's Center for Defense and Security Studies and an associate professor in political studies. Welcome, professor. Then um, we have Besma Momani, who's interim associate vice president, interdisciplinary research and full professor of political science, science at the University of Waterloo. And uh, the, our final panelist is Roland Paris, uh, Professor of International Affairs and Director of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa. Welcome. Um, and uh, I happen to be, am happy to be, honored to be a senior fellow at the Graduate School there. So thank you very much for all of you for taking the time to join us this morning. We'll get right into the first question then. Now, from your perspective, and this is the question for all the panelists, or in your area of expertise, what is the most important foreign policy challenge that the next government is going to face? And it's a three-parter, journalists love three parts, because how should, not, you can identify that challenge, but 
it would be good if you could suggest some ways that the government should be addressing it and then whether they have the capacity and the knowledge to do so. So for this first round, um, we'll, we'll go with the, the um, alphabetical order to start. So Senator Beam, could you start us off? Merci, Madeleine. Bonjour à toutes et, et tous, et merci pour l'invitation pour cette, cette discussion uh, très importante. Um, foreign policy issues uh, do not usually feature prominently in, uh, in elections in, in Canada. This one is no, uh, is no exception, and there was only a small portion of the French language leaders debate that was devoted to it. And in our history, the biggest foreign policy election was actually in, uh, in 1911 when uh, Laurier lost power uh, on the issue of trade reciprocity with the United States. And I would say, followed by uh, 1988, also the question of the free trade agreement with the United States was, uh, was omnipresent. And again, in 1993, but not as much, and that was, uh, that was NAFTA. So all of those foreign policy issues were actually interdomestic issues dealing with, uh, with the United States. Um, so while an important uh, issue in itself, Afghanistan is not the sort of foreign policy uh, issue, in my opinion, that will greatly influence this, uh, this particular uh, election. For me, the most important and overarching foreign policy challenge for the next government, setting aside the relationship with, uh, with the United States, which of course is primordial, and I know we'll get into that later on, is the ongoing dimensions of the COVID pandemic. We're not, we're not through it. It has an impact on bilateral relations, certainly with, uh, with the US and with other countries in terms of agreements um, on, on people uh, movement. Um, it has an impact on financial questions, both in monetary and in fiscal uh, policy as well. It has an impact on uh, development issues and how the rest of the world is going to cope with the fact that we're looking at boosters and they might not even be looking at their first injections yet. Uh, this is not going to go away anytime soon and there are implications all through, uh, through the piece. The international financial institutions have to uh, react and much has to be done. Now the government is already uh, addressing this through, uh, through various uh, committees and activities. And we have to remember that during an election period, the government operates under the, what's called the caretaker convention. So it's basically the public service that is running these, uh, these committees and these, uh, these task forces. But in my mind, as we look ahead, there will need to be a, a, a more coordinated policy planning mechanism possibly with some provincial input to look at the international implications, including through the United Nations and its specialized agencies. And the most obvious one is the World Health Organization, but there are others as well. There's, uh, there's UNDP, uh, there's the United Nations, the World Food Program, uh, and, uh, and others that will require a good deal of policy concentration where Canada working with allies and like-minded, I don't like using that word that much, but working with those who, uh, who, who look at things the same way we do through the OECD Development Assistance um, Committee and others will have to recommend uh, actions that uh, governments can take collectively to deal with this. And this will cascade all through the G7, the G20, and in other uh, particular particular councils. The knowledge and capacity question is going to come up a, a lot. It's, it's almost an unfair question because there's a lot that we as panelists don't know. I've had the benefit of being an insider in my previous career. So I know that there's an awful lot of knowledge and capacity through, uh, throughout government. Um, However, the way this works is that uh, whoever wins the election, there are elements in the platform and there are things that will be set out in a future speech from the throne where the public service will have to work on these, these particular issues and provide advice. So whereas at the political level, there will be a, a more generalized and sort of strategic approach uh, set out, it will be up to the public service to say, uh, yes, uh, we can do this or we can't do this or here is what we suggest and here is what we have done before and we're working with country X or country Y or organizations both regional uh, and uh, and the UN and maybe maybe some others to to address this. So I think on that last point, uh, we have to be careful to uh, when we talk about knowledge and capacity because it's something that uh, we don't necessarily know. I used to know about it. Um, I'm three years out. Watts has changed in uh, in three years. Thanks, Madeline.
Okay, thank you. It is a good point that uh, some of us are just guessing about what what sort of capacity that the government has. But uh, excellent. So you you picked out COVID as the first one. Um, Professor Sharon, would you like to uh, put your finger on what you think the most important foreign policy challenge is? Merci infiniment. C'est un plaisir d'être ici. I'm going to carry on from what the senator said, but rather than COVID, I want to focus in on the Canada-US relationship. It's often been said that our foreign policy is the United States. And I fear that there's um, a little bit of, uh, we're going to overlook the United States because we now have President Biden, whom we think is going to be far more amenable to uh, working with Canada. But we have to forget, you know, we can't forget that that relationship is so important. We, it represents, you know, the largest trading block in the world. Our relationship in managing the Great Lakes is responsible for clean drinking water for 40 million people. Uh, we are the largest energy exporter to the US. And of course, you know, pandemic mitigation is, is going to be vital to both Canada and the US because of our shared border. But, and this, it might be a function of my uh, research area, it's the defense relationship that needs serious attention. And that's for a number of reasons. One, we're in a time of great power politics. That combined with new technologies uh, and also the problematic scenes that are created by the US Unified Command Plan means that the US is feeling particularly vulnerable these days. And we know that Russia and China are very good at probing those scenes. And now that the US is feeling vulnerable, the 82 plus year relationship and promise we've had with the US that we will jointly defend North America is coming home to roost. Mm -hmm. The way that we are going to protect ourselves is via things like the binational agreement, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, and also our commitments to NATO. But it's specifically the Canada-US relationship that is really paramount. And that's because the US has told us they need us to do more. They are fundamentally rethinking what it means to defend the continent. And that is going to require some changes on our part, including some quite eye-watering spending. What they're trying to do is use uh, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, uh, eventually machine learning, and they want to really rethink how they change the approach to the homeland so that they can have what they call all domain awareness, which will give them then decision superiority and information dominance. But that's going to require Canada's support. And they've given us the list in a joint statement by Canada and the US. They said that there are, are four things that we need. The first is situational awareness, especially in the Northern and maritime approaches to the continent. Well, that means Canada because our Arctic is 40% of our landmass and we have the largest coastline in the world. They want to modernize command and control systems. They need new capabilities to deter and if necessary, defeat evolving aerospace threats to North America. And they need more research development and innovation to go into this cloud computing and artificial intelligence. And so that means via the binational agreement and also the tri-command relationship we have with the Canadian Joint Operations Command and US Northcom, they're expecting more of Canada. Now, the good news is we do have potentially uh, some of the tools that the US is looking for, especially our space-based assets, our radar sat constellation. But one of the things that we have difficulty with is a agreeing to commit those kind of funds. NORAD literally flies under the radar most of the time and people don't give it much thought on both sides of the border. But we also know that our capabilities when it comes to, for example, our interceptors, the CF-18s are badly in need of replacement. And it has been decades that we have been at this. And the US is feeling extremely vulnerable and they don't have time for this kind of dithering. Keep in mind that the US spends more on ground-based mid-course defense 
than we do on our entire defense budget. And while we used to be able to say, well, we're quality, not quantity, in these new geopolitical times, I'm not sure that that's going to be sufficient. Spending billions on deterrence, which is something that if successful, you should never see or need to resort to, is a tough sell when we are dealing with pandemics, economic uh, uh, um, vulnerability and the like, but I would say that relationship needs tension. Okay, thank you. High watering spending on defense. That's <laughs> definitely a challenge for the, for the next government. Okay, we'll move on, but that's a, an interesting perspective. Uh, uh, Professor Maman, Mamani, uh, would you like to give us what you think the biggest challenge is going to be in your area of expertise? Thanks, Madeline. Um, there are so many <laughs> things I think going on. Um, it really is a very, I think, turbulent time in uh, the international system. I don't see myself as a pessimistic person, but for the very first time, I feel pretty pessimistic about a lot of things going on all at the same time. I mean, I'd say um, the one thing, of course, um, that really int interests me but worries me is really just that democracy is under attack in many ways. Uh, we live in a moment where we do see the rise of populism. Uh, we thought it was sort of uh, perhaps maybe nipped in the bud. There was some good news uh, globally that uh, looked towards uh, that being put under control, but I think we're back. Uh, seeing populism with a vengeance. And part of that is, I think uh, there are some who will make the connection, although it's it's not a clean one, but I think that's out there with the rise of the alt-right. Uh, the alt-right is getting more powerful. Populism is sort of the fuel um, that brings uh, you know more, more to the fire, if you will. Um, of course, uh, part of that we thought was just Trumpism, but I think Trumpism is not just about Trump. It really is that ism. And that's that is very much well and alive in the United States. And I think we maybe took a, a moment of relief, uh, sorry to be very political about that, but I think it's fair to say we, most of us on this panel did take a sign of relief when Biden was elected. Um, but but you know, Trumpism is very alive and well. Uh, I mean, the stat that I keep hearing about US Congress, you know, 25% of Republicans are QAnon supporters. I mean, adamant QAnon supporters. Um, this is really quite scary. And it's not just the, the sort of, you know, um, conspiracy theories of QAnon and so forth, but it's this overall anti-immigrant xenophobic sentiment that's growing, um, the loss of faith in experts, uh, the loss of faith in government. I mean, public trust is one of the most important things to combat or to having to combat uh, COVID, right? We know there's a correlation, a very clean correlation almost, uh, with a lack of faith in government, trust in government, and uh, being uh, hesitant about the vaccine. All of that, frankly, is uh, very alive and well, and it's growing. Um, I'm sad to say it's even growing in Canada um, you know, if I may, again, I'm sorry I'm being political, but, you know, the PPC party, which uh, is sort of a classic quintessential type of populist party. I mean, I'm for the first time surprised as a Canadian to see more of their signs on lawns than anybody else's in a federal election. Um, this is really quite, I think, troubling. And this is what we're, we're talking about. Um, there is also a, in that movement, a very strong, not just the PPC, but that broad populist uh, movement that feeds uh, and takes energy from the alt-right, uh, a very anti-feminist agenda, uh, very much skeptical of, of the environmentalist movement. I mean, there are so many things combined in there uh, that worry me. So it's not just the likes of, uh, of you know, um, Victor Orban in, in Hungary, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and increasingly, I think it's going to challenge international institutions. That movement is highly skeptical of international institutions. I mean, we see ourselves in so many ways as such an engaged partner in these international organizations as a, you know, a response to these wicked problems with, that need to be solved through multilateral organizations. Well, you know, for this movement, this populist alt-right movement, there is indeed a very strong skepticism, um, almost disdain, hatred uh, for international organizations. So again, how politicians, particularly Canada, which has always, I think, been as a middle power by nature, uh, leaned on these organizations to, um, to collectively respond to these problems, because we're not a great power, we can't do it alone, um, is really challenging. Uh, and I think it's going to be challenging for every leader, uh, whatever leader comes forward uh, in this federal election to sort of keep a lid on this. Um, quite literally, I think it needs to be managed. And, and they're growing in numbers, they're growing in intensity. It's a global movement. Increasingly, there's connection in those global movements. Um, so that's something that I would say keeps me up at night. Thank you. 
Okay, well, thank you for that. We will, uh, if we have time, sort of drill down a bit into some of the issues, actually some of the issues that all the panelists are raising that we will drill down, but in particular, the uh, authoritarianism and uh, the rise of populism around the world and what sort of things the government might be able to do to, to meet that challenge. But we'll go on to Professor Paris and, and your number one pick for a uh, foreign policy challenge for the next government. Uh, thanks, Madeline. And uh, thank you for hosting this discussion. I really enjoyed hearing the, the, the initial thoughts of, of my fellow panelists. You know, when I, when I was thinking about this question, I, in my mind, was uh, differentiating a list of issues that the next government is going to have to deal with right out of the gate and on one hand, and Peter mentioned, obviously, dealing with the COVID pandemic in Canada, internationally, uh, and in Canada, the ultimate interdomestic issue, uh, and the all of the reverberating effects of the COVID pandemic, it will be a kind of shifting point uh, in international affairs, I'm sure, looking back decades from now. And uh, but there's others that are going to be hitting a new government right out of the gate. There's a the COP26 climate conference in November. There's uh, uh, Joe Biden will be hosting a summit for democracies uh, in uh, December. Of course, there's an ongoing diplomatic crisis uh, with China, and any number of issues might pop up. And you know, all of the issues that I mentioned are in a way extremely important. There's always the risk though that, uh, and this is what governments do, they tend to govern based on things that are happening and it's natural to expect a significant amount of reactivity by any government uh, in their foreign policy or domestic policies, but there are longer term structural changes taking place in international affairs too, some of which are visible in these immediate problems but which are longer term. And so part of the apparatus of government, and that includes part of the act of governing, needs to be, in my view, paying attention to these longer term challenges. And you know, what we're seeing a, a dramatic sh a shift in, in geopolitical power, we're seeing rising economic competition and technological competition, we're seeing the kind of uh, emboldened authoritarians uh, using new kinds of tools uh, to disrupt uh, democratic uh, politics. And then the cascading geopolitical effects of even something like climate change and the impact on our Arctic, uh, which is of growing geopolitical interest. And of all those longer term challenges, I'd have to say uh, that the maybe the most obvious, but the, also the most important is dealing with a changing United States. And, you know, Andrea mentioned this, and I agree with her, and it, Peter did mention it as well. Uh, it's the primordial relationship. Uh, but there's a risk that having a friendlier uh, US president in the White House in Joe Biden, take some of the urgency away from the discussion of how do we deal with the United States that is changing. And we should not fool ourselves. Uh, the United States is uh, more inward looking. It is more divided politically. Uh, it is more protectionist. And it is a country that has elected a Donald Trump, almost re-elected a Donald, Donald Trump, and presumably could do the same thing again. Our interests are so exposed in relation to our, uh, our relations with the United States that to me, that's the most important issue for the next government, thinking not just about managing issues with the Biden administration now, but thinking about how to deal with the United States, which is changing and is gonna to continue to display these qualities even after uh, Joe Biden has left office. Okay, thank you very much. It's actually a perfect lead in to the next subject that I wanted to touch on, which was whether or not uh, any of you detect an emerging Biden doctrine out of his actions to date. Now I realize he hasn't been in office that long, but I'm, I'm wondering whether you've picked up on things 
uh, that you, you, you can see that how he's going to govern take more shape. And actually, Roland Singh, as you, you, you're up and just mentioned the US, why don't we start with you? Sorry, Professor Paris. Uh, I'm gonna get too informal okay. here. <laughs> and, and then we'll go backwards down the list. So let's, let's start with you. Okay, happy to kick off this discussion. And please do call me Roland. Um, yeah, so is there a Biden doctrine? I mean, Biden himself kind of presented his doctrine early this year in, a, in an article in, in Foreign Affairs. And I think that, uh, that he and his team have been pretty consistent in re-articulating the same themes. And uh, they come out more or less in, in what we're seeing from his administration so far. First and foremost, his foreign policy is about strength, is about revitalizing the United States at home revitalizing the U.S. economy, re recovering from the pandemic, revitalizing U.S. democracy. So uh, it's a kind of building block uh, strategy, uh, recognizing that uh, a weakened United States means a weaker uh, U.S. in the world. Secondly, uh, there, Biden has committed to uh, restoring a positive relationship with allies, recognizing that allies uh, act in many issue in, in many issue areas as um, amplifiers and strengtheners of U.S. foreign policy, and he certainly has signaled uh, a stronger interest in working with allies than his predecessor. You'll recall in the spring when he went to Europe for the G7 summit, NATO summit, he was saying all the right words. Uh, there are tensions now, and of course the Afghanistan withdrawal. Uh, uh, triggered uh, some uh, concerns and anger, some quarters in, in Europe and elsewhere about whether uh, allies had been consulted on that and a couple of other issues. Uh, so, you know, I think that the honeymoon uh, aura of his uh, America is back has already dissipated in Europe, but he's still clearly committed to working more closely with allies uh, thirdly, I think that there's a, an emphasis on uh, major power competition, So, and this comes through in his Afghanistan and Middle East positions more generally. Uh, he is re reallocating resources in his mind to issues and areas of the world that are strategically, as he sees them, more essential for the United States. That raises a whole bunch of questions about what happens in those areas of the world that might receive less U.S. attention, but he seems to be following along that path. There is a caution uh, in his foreign policy. Uh, he has said that the era of U.S. military occupations meant to rebuild countries is over. I don't think many people would disagree with that formulation, but his actions have raised questions about the staying power of the United States, maybe unfairly, but nevertheless, you can't do what he did without raising those questions. And, and we'll see what kind of appetite he has for uh, American uh, leadership and the costs of American leadership uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. I, I hadn't seen that foreign policy article, and I'm always interested in what people say they're going to do and then what they actually do and whether there's a gap between them. But mm -hmm. Professor Shaw, you mentioned the US too as well as, as part of your, um, your relations with the US. So do you see any signs, of, have things happened that make you think that there's a, an emerging policy out there with Biden? Well, thank you. I think I think there is one, but I don't think it's unique to Biden. I think it's sort of the long-standing uh, modus operandi of successive uh, U.S. governments, and it's something called new realism, putting national interests first, uh, and that's what uh, uh, Professor Paris also talked about. Um, but also renewed attention to the rule-based order, and that's because of this great power competition. Let's not forget that China and Russia, for example, uh, have always resented the fact that the U.S. has been out front in the rules that govern the world that benefits the U.S. and, and, and Canada as a result. And so that rule-based order is starting to crumble, and that's going to be one of the, the main um, foci. In 2016, Biden wrote an article in Foreign Affairs, which is you know, sort of the go-to place to find out how the US is thinking. 
Uh, he's often been described as the golden retriever to Obama's blue cat indifferent uh, sort of approach to uh, foreign affairs. He's very deeply invested in relationships. And so that's a cue for Canada that we have to nurture that relationship. We cannot leave any U.S. billets uh, open and take it for granted. It'll just kind of run itself. Uh, and also the next prime minister is going to have to work very hard to work directly with Biden um, and Biden's advisors and not just allow it to descend to technical Technocrat, technocrat level. But one of the things he said in that 2016 article was that uh, the foundations of US global leadership res reside first and foremost in our dynamic economy, peerless military, and universal values. And these will benefit uh, Canada. But um, we have to make sure that we don't overstretch ourselves because the request by the U.S. is going to just keep coming and coming. There's a sense that it's going to expect more of allies. And what we need to do is stop uh, ad hocery foreign policy and start doing foresight. What's in our national interests? And given our capabilities, where do those interests align? And as long as we're out in front and very clear about where it is we can match and not, the U.S. is usually uh, amenable to, to those compromises. What they don't like is surprises. When we say, yeah, and then we don't follow through, that's not going to fly uh, in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I haven't seen that article either. I guess I should renew my subscription to foreign policy if I want to know what's going on in the world. Uh, Senator Beam, I want to turn to you there because the US, I mean, everyone is stressing as you did, US is our, our major, um, major partner, major preoccupation in foreign policy. It's also, I mean, I realize this is part of it in trade policy. I'm not sure if you wanted to go there, but have you seen anything in general that's giving you a sense of what the Biden administration's policy is going to be like? Well, thank you very much. Um, I agree with a lot of what has been said. Um, I, I think there is a Biden doctrine. It's not just an emerging one. And uh, uh, Roland uh, said, uh, mentioned the, the campaign. And of course, there are articles. And uh, a lot of this is working with, uh, with allies. And this democracy summit that's coming up uh, will be an example of this. And he's also following the mantra set out by Barack Obama, which, is, uh, which was, uh, don't do stupid stuff. Now, um, President Obama used a four-letter word, also beginning with us, to describe that. Um, so he was he was very uh, very categorical in his uh, uh, in his views. In my experience, having um, worked with uh, the last uh, four prime ministers and meeting their uh, their counterparts, we have to know what we're going in to uh, discuss. And more often than not, the top two or three items are bilateral. They're softwood lumber, it's, uh, it's steel and aluminum, it's um, supply management uh, in the dairy sector, it's borders. And, and this has been a continuing thing. So if we want to go beyond that, and then you've kind of exhausted the, the meeting, we have to be in a position, and I think Andrea suggested this, to, to be prepared to, uh, to offer something, offer some, some niche uh, expertise where we can come up with some ideas uh, taking advantage of the good relationship that exists at senior levels and, and has to exist. And we can't forget that after Biden was elected, every, his first call was to the Prime Minister of Canada and every one of his cabinet members, as they were appointed, their first call was to their Canadian counterparts. This sent a signal. Now, were we sleeping? I don't, I, I don't think so. And Andrea mentioned uh, technocratic cooperation. There's a wealth of that all over the place, but there will be big things coming up. Uh, the defense of North America is an example. How to deal with uh, within the new NAFTA with a Mexico that might be a little bit recalcitrant. What can Canada do in this, uh, in this hemisphere, for example? We're part of the Lima group that is dealing with the Venezuela issue. We have a relationship with Cuba that few countries uh, have. This is an area where if we are, uh, are creative and we have the political will uh, to do that, we can 
suggest ideas to the United States. I was reflecting on the weekend. I, I served in Washington as minister at the time of 9-11 at our uh, embassy. And in the immediate aftermath, we had some ideas where we went into, uh, into the White House and into the State Department as to what could constitute a loya jirga, uh, an assembly in Afghanistan and the like. And the Americans picked, uh, picked them up uh, and they said this was, this was really good. So it's not just a pat on the, on the head, but it's working cooperatively on, on certain issues, recognizing, as Roland has said, that there will be a, a very vast internal um, debate within the U.S. about the U.S. place in the world. We've seen this in cycles through the last century uh, in particular. And the final point I wanted to make is on the rules-based international order. This almost killed our um, communique uh, at Charlevoix, G7. I was uh, Prime Minister Trudeau Sherpa at, uh, at the time. And I got into a, a big debate with John Bolton in front of uh, leaders and, uh, and President Trump, where um, Bolton basically said to our, our wish to have a reference on relying on the rules-based international order, he said, there isn't one. And I said, of course there is. And so uh, in the first instance, we then compromised and said an international based order. And then in the rest of the document, it was the international based order. But Biden says he believes this. Uh, Blinken is a, is a pro. He was deputy secretary uh, before. And they have a very, very talented foreign service that they're trying to build up after it got decimated uh, to a great degree during the Pompeo and, uh, and Trump years. We need to work closely with the US, uh, be fearless, don't stand back sitting on our you know, friendly, friendly neighbor uh, status and work on the big issues how to handle the pandemic uh, internationally, what about international migration, uh, what about continuing to try to fix Afghanistan. And there's, contrary to what you read in the, in the media, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes on, uh, on that. So uh, that's, that's sort of where I am, and I apologize for my flashing light. It's the vote light being tested uh, in my office. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Professor Mamani, have you got some thoughts on what you think is the emerging Biden doctrine? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, just, you know, I, I mean, agree with everything that's been said. Um, well, I mean, in some way, uh, you know, it was sort of a pivot to Asia kind of concept um, that Obama had. And of course, as VP was, uh, I would say Biden was certainly supportive of, but we all um, could agree that I think that pivot to Asia never really quite happened, partly because of events, mostly in the Middle East and, and beyond. And so I think there is a re-energy of that overall uh, message. Um, certainly the rhetoric has changed um, and this sort of appreciation for multilateralism in its historical context is really welcome news, but I don't think um, there is um, uh, quite the same sort of energy to sort of use multilateralism in the, in the way before. And that's partly because I think the U.S. is more introverted now. Um, look, the economy is, is struggling. Um, I think it's a global economic challenge that we're all facing. And the United States uh, certainly is very concerned about sort of declining st living standards, um, you know, race wars that are happening. Um, you know, we, we can almost say it's kind of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a protectionist light uh, kind of sentiment, I think, in, in the United States today. Um, some of that is just not just at the federal level, but at the state level. Um, so the U.S. is polarized. We know that, right? I mean, you can't ignore, uh, you know, there was a really interesting survey that was done recently about people are, are um, you know, are very happy to have interracial marriage, inter um, religious marriages, but not marrying from, uh, you know, a Democrat to a Republican. I mean, this sort of idea that there are such clear lines uh, that are almost tribal, as some have argued, is really quite uh, fascinating. Uh, and as a Middle East analyst, you know, calling it sectarian feels very much apt. Um, so it's an introverted U.S. Uh, I think there is uh, certainly a desire to end the forever wars, as we're seeing with Afghanistan. Um, that, of course, is not just something that comes from the Republican base. This is not actually a Trumpism. This is really also at the core of the new Democratic Party. Um, sorry, I apologize. I'm just going to stop. Here. I know it's dust cleaning, which is the sad part. Um, so really, this is about, I think, um, not just a Republican thing like we would use, we would have thought before. It really is coming from the progressive base of the United of the Democratic Party. And, uh, you know, the young Democrats that are in Congress are pushing for this. I think there is uh, certainly an alignment almost amongst both 
uh, Republican Democrats uh, about that. And Biden, you know, I think maybe has some vestiges of the past in sort of romanticizing, you know, American role, not quite Reagan-esque, but certainly this kind of, you know, that somehow the Americans have this moral authority to uh, spread democracy as, as Reagan was most famously thought of in terms of foreign policy. But at the same time, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the United States has changed fundamentally from those days and they are more introverted. And Biden is, I think, trying to give as much um, to that base, uh, despite what I think is his own um, instincts to be probably, I think, more um, active uh, globally. Part of that, of course, is, is the military costs. Um, this is something that is widely criticized, right, within the United States. The, the infrastructure is decrepit. I mean, it's very sad to say you go to LaGuardia, at least the old LaGuardia, um, and it's, it's, it's not, you know, commensurate with what you would expect from, you know, the leading global economy, uh, glo leading country in the global economy. So there is a lot of need for investment at home. The whole approach of Biden, in, in fact, I think he saw, said was, and it might've been Blink and I apologize, I'm confusing the two, but was this idea of this middle class first, right? Um, seeing things through the middle class. What is it, what's good for the middle class will determine what is foreign policy. Right. And, and that, to me, speaks to a protectionist light agenda. Um, so it's there. Um, certainly the environment and climate change is being accepted uh, by the Biden administration in a way that we haven't seen before, which is fantastic. And that's giving something to that Democratic base, the very progressive base that really wants um, sort of tangible wins. And, and they're very much in favor of that. I'll just go quickly and I'll fi finalize with that because I know we're going to talk about China. So I'll avo avoid the conversation about that. But on um, when it comes to the forever wars, which I think there is an impulse, of course, as I said, from the Democratic base and the Republicans to do, you know, what we don't talk about is the military industrial complex. I mean, this is a huge, huge enterprise in the United States. It's not um, insignificant. And can Biden really make this, you know, um, shift away from the forever wars without addressing an important component of what is the core um, challenge, which is can he or the administration really do this uh, while you know chipping away at this military industrial complex. I mean, we're just getting some fantastic reporting happening about the whole Afghanistan debacle, about how much of this was guided, uh, unfortunately, by you know all the profiteers, right? That included you know Hill and Knowlton in Virginia to um, you know all the the major defense uh, procurement processes and, and companies um, that really kind of were the the, the champions of the war in many ways within the Beltway. So there's lots to say about that, but I think um, that was just a few things I wanted to add to the great um, summary that my colleagues uh, pointed out. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you, one of your colleagues, uh, Professor Paris, has asked to uh, interject a very brief comment at the end on, on the US. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, underscore something that both Besma and, and Peter were saying. Uh, and Peter mentioned in particular the importance of Canadian officials, Canada coming forward with constructive ideas. And it's, it's so important. You think about all many of the important things that we've done together with the United States have initially been Canadian proposals in the past. And to the extent that we can present to the United States ideas that can help the US achieve its goals, but also things that help Canada, tant mieux, as they say in French. Specific example would be what's going on in Central America with a governance crisis and a migration crisis. We in Canada have an interest in, in helping to uh, restore some semblance of decent governance in Central America. And we have an interest because we have longstanding relationships in that part of, of the world. It's our neighborhood. We also have an interest because we know that a migration crisis drives, in some cases, the worst instincts in American foreign policy, which indirectly end up hurting Canadian interests too. So to the extent that Canada can be involved in an even more uh, a concentrated way in helping to try to address some of the uh, uh, governance crises in Central America. There's an example of something practical, something that serves our interests and something that would help the United States. Okay, thank you. That, that uh, um, is something concrete. I guess that's what we're looking for here is concrete suggestions as well about uh, not only what the challenges are, but what our room for maneuver in Canada is in terms of addressing them. So uh, it has come up, uh, uh, Professor Mamani uh, mentioned about Obama's pivot to Asia and Asia has come up uh, a little bit in the 
election campaign, but almost solely in regards to China and um, the imprisonment of the two Michaels and what's the prime minister going to do about it. But uh, I wanted to ask the panelists a slightly broader question about you know, how Canada should be dealing with this, this new China that we're seeing that is more aggressive, more determined um, to uh, get his, its, uh, its way in the world. So um, actually, Professor Mamani, seeing as you mentioned, Asia, I'm gonna start with you there uh, and just briefly, uh, I'm asking all the panelists to be brief, you know, <laughs> which is hard on a topic like this. What should the approach be on China from the government? Well, um, I think that's the thorniest issue facing um, all governments today. Look, um, we can't ignore that China is a rival. It is a challenge. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's, of course, we've talked about the two Michaels. Um, it's the very style uh, of politics. It's almost uh, unchina like Look, this is a new China. Uh, China under President Xi, which is very nationalist, extremely nationalist. Um, and it is uh, very much in context of what they see as 100 years of humiliation, um, is, is, I think, dangerous, uh, partly because of also the strength that it comes with it. Now, we have to be careful to at the same time, I mean, I'm going to be a bit cautious with my words, partly because I don't want to um, you know, add to the fire of sort of, you know, that we have engaged in some sort of cold war with China, because I don't think that's fair. And we're also... Um, unbelievably uh, interlinked uh, with China. Uh, and it's not just often China direct, it's also the entire global supply chain often runs through China. So we can't ignore uh, the relevance and the importance of having a decent relationship with China, but it's not the China of 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It's really fundamentally changed. It's a young, uh, newer group, uh, very nationalistic and really doesn't want to um, sort of be a, a rule taker. It wants to be a rule maker. And I think most of us would agree, you know, in terms of how um, the Chinese society is structured as, as I should say political um, system is structured and, and, and the entire, um, I think, very authoritarian way of, of governing is something that is not to our appetite. So I'm not interested as a, as a, as a Canadian citizen to be in you know, an international system guided by that kind of Chinese principles as seen by particularly President Xi. So I think there's a lot to be worried about here. I don't wanna, again, contribute to, the, to what I think is a new sort of securitization of our China policy, but it is something we can't ignore uh, on the cyber side. I know Andrea talked about that a bit. It is very troubling. Um, certainly, you know, I think Russia is probably a more dangerous actor on the cyber front, but I don't think we can ignore the industrial espionage that's happening. We can't ignore, I think, the new types of, um, uh, you know, uh, cyber attacks that are happening that are originating from China. I mean, there is a huge cyber army in China that is, is working at this, unlike the Russians who really, really want to just divide us, you know, to just make them look good by seeing us being chaotic. On the China side, it really is economic. Um, and so they're at war with us economically, and yet we're dependent on them economically. I mean, it really is a catch-22 for any government. And I think it requires a lot of sensibility, maturity uh, in dealing with China. Um, I think we need to have certain red lines. And I actually really appreciated uh, that meeting that uh, Biden had with Xi. The way it was all conducted was, I think, really well done as well in terms of orchestrated um, to ensure that there wasn't, um, I think, that kind of, um, uh, you know, seeing acquiescence that we have. Uh, but there needs to be sort of rules. Uh, and I think that um, what we're going to want to see is uh, more, I think, sort of red lines. Uh, this is not acceptable. Um, and, and we need to be really clear on those red lines and, and be honest about what the reaction is going to be. Some of that Trump did with sort of the new ways of responding to cyber activities. But I think we as a, as a you know, as G7, um, as NATO partners, although the NATO is partners is becoming complicated with, with countries like Turkey and Hungary and Poland, uh, we still need to have very clear messaging on what are we going to do uh, when we see very clear evidence of that kind of, um, um, you know, unacceptable behavior. Um, and lastly, I mean, of course, we can't ignore what's happening in with the Uyghur people. I think this is one of the huge blights on humanity today that this is happening under our watch. Uh, we said never again, and it's happening again. Um, how we manage that under the circumstances of that economic dependency I mentioned is going to be tough, um, but I don't think we can skirt around the issue. There is uh, very much a cultural genocide 
uh, I don't know if we want to use the word ethnic genocide, but absolutely repression, oppressiveness. Um, and that is something that I think is going to haunt us one day when we look back on how we manage the relationship with China. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Professor Sharon, would you like to pick up from there? Thanks very much. Um, I, I think there are a couple of things that Canada can do. And, and again, the U.S., I think, is going to be in the lead role. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor, and Kirk Campbell, who runs uh, Biden's Asia policy, said that we need to establish favorable terms of coexistence, thus avoiding the kind of threat perceptions that were a feature of the Cold War. So what does that mean? The big advantage that we have is that we are uh, allies with uh, in NATO. And when you put all the NATO countries together, that represents a billion people. And so that can be a bulwark against what is often the Chinese go to uh, um, modus operandi, which is to sort of weaponize uh, economics uh, and, and, and make us feel vulnerable. Uh, we all take a giant step back when, uh, for example, China had Australia in their sights. Um, we need to come together and, and use that allyship and partnership to the advantage. The other thing we need to do is provide more avenues to avoid misperceptions, accidents, and incidents that can quickly escalate beyond the point of competition into conflict. And so, if, for example, in the Arctic, a lot of people have been calling for some kind of forum other than the Arctic Council, where we can have those discussions uh, about what is happening on the defense side. Now, on the defense side, Canada has been contributing to what we call the Quad, uh, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which includes US, Japan, India, and Australia for the first time in 2021 in January. The RCAF sent an aurora to take place in this uh, exercise called Sea Dragon. Um, but it's simple things like thinking about, well, what are we naming our exercises? Perhaps Sea Dragon is not the best name to give an exercise that might just antagonize uh, China unnecessarily. Certainly when Russia has its ZEPAD exercises, which are going on now, and ZEPAD is Russian for the West, it certainly does raise the tension levels. And so, you know, we need to find a way to coexist with China. We need to be consistent in calling out uh, bad behavior. We need to be prepared for the bluster that's going to come, but we have to use our strength of allyship and partnership so that we're a united front uh, against China. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the, the sea dragon. I think they have a, an icebreaker that's called something very similar to that, or snow dragon, or something. Yeah, the right. Zulong. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, Senator Bean, have you got some thoughts on? China. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, Andrea and Bestma have made some uh, some very trenchant comments on uh, on China, and I won't be uh, uh, speaking for very long because I know we have a, a time uh, a time issue, but. In, in my previous career and, and now, I've never seen anything as complex as the relationship that we have with, uh, with China. And as the 10th largest economy in the, in the world, Canada, and as a significant producer of raw materials and agricultural goods, our value to China is clear, but China is less dependent on us in trade and investment terms than we might be uh, on China. Add, add to this the increasing uh, Chinese assertiveness, whether it's in the South China Sea, um, Taiwan, uh, retaliation uh, measures uh, that was touched on Australia in particular, but uh, Norway in a previous uh, uh, connotation, uh, the so-called wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, it's, uh, it's pretty shrill and unsophisticated in my, uh, in my opinion. To add to that, the internal issues, the Uyghurs were, were mentioned, and, uh, and Hong Kong, where incidentally we have 300,000 Canadian citizens, uh, plus the two Michaels incarcerated and the others who are incarcerated, um, Huawei, 5G networks, there's no shortage of complexity here. And I think Andrea said it uh, correctly, we need to work with, uh, with other countries. Uh, the, the Declaration on Arbitrary Detention was, I think, a very successful uh, effort, but it's probably not enough. And in the past, what we've been trying to do, and I, I know that particularly from my work in the, in the G7, is try to come up with, uh, with common positions, uh, particularly on trade and investment. I don't want to talk too much about trade and investment, 
but there was always the problem of, uh, of coordination, whether it was from the Asian, the point of view of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, where all G7 countries had agreed to, to work together to set out the Articles of Agreement. Uh, and then a few countries, uh, led by the UK, decided to, uh, to get involved, and that is how individually, uh, to get into the vernacular, we get picked off and, uh, and we don't manage to have a coherent policy. We can't, we can't do it all by ourselves. We can't, uh, we can't go alone. So engagement with China, I agree with what previous panelists have said. It needs to be measured. Uh, we have to call out the human rights uh, violation. We have to coordinate with our allies and, and share approaches. Uh, going along with, uh, with uh, big, uh, big rhetoric um, is not necessarily the way to, uh, way to go. I reject the term that you know we have an impending uh, Cold War. The Cold War was the Soviet Union and its allies, and they were Comic Con countries. It was not anything economic. We didn't have big trade uh, uh, measures or issues with uh, with that particular uh, block. China is on track to becoming the world's largest economy, and it pushes an authoritarian uh, form of, uh, of mercantilist capitalism, ironically led by the Communist Party, which I don't think is what Marx and Engels had in mind uh, centuries ago. So the planning and execution of our strategies in a new government will be, uh, will be important. I think we have the talent internally uh, to, push, to push forward. There's no shortage of uh, armchair experts across the country that will tell what, whoever is e elected to form the government uh, what to do, but it has to be measured and it has to be consistent what we do. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Although I'm disappointed you didn't want to talk about trade and investment more. I love those two areas, but I, I'm, I'm right. joking. We have to move on for now, but we, we can come back to that in the questions. And I think uh, Professor Paris, you haven't weighed in on this. Uh, well, so much has been already said, and I think that we've had a really great, uh, from the pre three interventions here, um, description of the complexity of the relationship and of China in the world. It's really remarkable, you know, in terms of the speed and significance of the geopolitical changes that we're seeing taking place. And kind of managing and responding to China's rise is arguably the single most important geopolitical fact of this of this uh, century so far and may remain the central geopolitical fact of this century for, uh, for, for many years, if not decades to come. Part of the complexity that we've heard described uh, requires um, uh, a, a clarity with regard to how we're responding to different aspects of the relationship. And this is the paradox that on one hand, we need to be pushing in some areas and pushing back against China, uh, even confronting China in some areas. In other areas, we need to be competing with China, say in the development of new kinds of uh, critically important technologies. And in yet other areas, there's a real importance to be cooperating if possible with China. And you think about climate change or you think about global health, the next pandemic preparedness, uh, or even uh, on matters of arms control, whether it's uh, cyber weapons or uh, conventional arms control. So you have this emerging giant, which poses a threat, yet it, its cooperation is essential in some areas, and it's a competitor in other areas. That makes for an extremely complicated uh, policy environment. I like the way the Biden administration has talked about uh, competition and cooperation and confrontation. Uh, it's not, it doesn't make for a very kind of black and white story, but in what we do need is clarity within each of these areas. For example, uh, on the Uyghur situation, uh, that's clearly uh, an affront uh, to human rights. And, uh, and there uh, leads to the last point, which is that Canada's influence as the other speakers have suggested, really comes through coordinating uh, with other countries. And this is where Canada can continue to play a role and hopefully an even stronger role in helping to uh, build coalitions of countries uh, that can stand up to China in sp on specific issues. 
Uh, and one of the really critical issues are these emerging uh, a, a, a strategically important technologies. We're having uh, Europeans and Americans and others working together on shared standards uh, will be even more important. So, you know, Canada has historically done a good job of playing a bridging role across the Atlantic. This is something that is clearly in our interests not least because this is the best way to be building a kind of a grouping that can push back against China when our national interests are, in, are affected, but also because we have an interest in building economic arrangements where we are inside the tent rather than outside and potentially vulnerable to actions that the United States or Europe might take where Canada could be hit almost accidentally as collateral damage. Okay, thank you. Now, the theme seems to come up a lot of building relationships with others in order to push back. Now, we were going to move on um, to uh, authoritarianism and populism, uh, but it is the time for questions. And actually, one of the uh, participants has asked a question just on that theme. So we'll move seamlessly over to um, the questions. And this one is from uh, I, I'm not sure actually if people want to know who the question is from. So maybe uh, I, I will just uh, say the question, given the rise of populism and authoritarianism in the world, what are the main options for Canada to bolster its defense of democracy, especially as the United States reputation erodes over time? Um, now, you don't all have to answer it, but I am going to ask Professor Momami to start with it because this is a point that you had raised so we can get into it a bit more about what are the options that are out there. It's a great question. I mean, it's, it's a tricky one, right? There's no easy policy fix <laughs> for ideological movements, which I think populism and nationalism, um, particularly the kind of authoritarian nationalism that we see today, uh, there's no easy fix. Uh, I think, well, first of all, we have to practice or do what we say, um, do what we, oh my gosh, can't even think today, sorry, this is my fourth meeting. Um, you know, but we have to practice it, right? And be true to it. So, you know, we are, I think a healthy liberal democracy. We, there's always room for improvement when it comes to democratization. And I think we have to be careful about uh, increasingly, um, you know, sounding Reagan-esque by, you know, suggesting that somehow we have the solutions. Uh, we don't have the solutions always, and I think we have learned from that uh, mistake when it comes to sort of thinking about, um, you know, nation building abroad. But I think uh, on that, uh, look, there's a there is a dangerous current of populism that does, I think, invoke um, a lot of alt right movements that is dangerous. Um, I think part of what is some of the remedy or some of the solutions that you could bring forward is increasing transparency, improving uh, faith in government by uh, constant communication. I mean, I think there are uh, lots of things that can be improved in terms of, you know, government um, really trying to be, you know, honest with people, uh, the public. You know, policy making is hard. I mean, I'm humbled by the folks uh, on the panel who have been in policy positions. Uh, it's really easy for, for us as academics to stand back and say, well, this should be done. You know, there is uh, no easy solution sometimes, and it's all, there's always a trade off when it comes to policy making. But I think, you know, strengthening democracy, you know, it, which is just not about voting, it's much more than that. Um, you know, everything from you know, instilling civic values in people. Uh, I mean, explaining, uh, you know, why uh, we, you know, um, uh, as, a, as a democracy, why we do things this way, what's the alternative? Um, you know, it's almost going back to the basics in terms of really giving young, you know, young kids a, a good lesson in civics education. Uh, you know, we focus so much on STEM and I'm a a huge proponent of, you know, ensuring that we have, uh, you know, increased our competency in STEM in this country. There's a lot more improvement that can be done, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that there isn't a role for uh, a liberal arts education. There is there's a real important role for critical thinking skills. Uh, I mean, this is one way to really counter uh, some of those movements uh, when you think about QAnon and so forth. There, there's a lot that can be done, but these are slow watching the grass grow types of policy initiatives. It's, there's no overnight fix. Um, so again, I think, 
it's it's a thorny issue. How we do it is by focusing on the home front first and foremost, uh, supporting civil society organizations globally, uh, NGOs. Again, CSOs are really at the forefront of pushing uh, for good governance. Sometimes in many countries, uh, you may not have you know a, a parliament to deal with and a, and a democratic system, but you know the media is an important role. Uh, again, journalists do a great service um, to that in many ways. Um, and supporting also, um, as I said, uh, you know, critical thinking skills in any way that we can, education, inviting uh, international students, which are an, a fantastic ambassador uh, for, for Canada uh, when many of them return home. Um, those are just little things, but again, I wish I had a, a, quick, a quick, easy solution. Maybe the, the former policy folks here are better at it. Okay, well, Senator Beam has his hand up, so maybe he's got the quick fix. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, one has to be careful not to necessarily link populism and authoritarianism. Uh, if you look at the history of, uh, of our country, we've had a real populist uh, streak in, uh, in, uh, in the development of, of Canada, and it's been to the benefit, I think, uh, in, uh, in many ways. If you look at the rise of the progressives around uh, the time of World War I, the social credit, the C CCF in the, in the West, the NDP, the Reform Party, the Bloc Québécois, yeah, with, uh, with certain policy perspectives, but, uh, but nonetheless populist in their, uh, their origins. Uh, what I think is of, of greater concern, I'm an independent senator, but I'm going to get very, very political for a moment. I just find it bizarre that we have a populist party right now, led by the weakest foreign minister we've ever had, openly calling for revolution so as to maintain for Canadians the basic right to infect other citizens. I just, I just can't believe it. But nonetheless, it's out there. Uh, Besma mentioned uh, the lawn signs uh, all, all over the place. We'll see what, uh, what happens. But I think this reflects also the osmosis of conspiracy theories um, and the like that have been perpetuated in, uh, in social media. So social media, that gets, you get into the, the, the cyber world that Andrea had mentioned earlier in her uh, intervention. And there have been a lot of international discussions on the topic and the context of cybersecurity regulation of the, the internet. And one thing, some of the malign actors, and they are state actors, and I'm not going to name them, but we know who they are, they're trying to bend uh, the rules to suit themselves. And that basically is censorship. And that is the authoritarianism that we're, uh, we're beginning to, uh, to see. So for, for Canada, a lot of this has been handled by interior ministries or uh, security ministries and, uh, and the like. The importance of internal uh, coordination, particularly then when we go out and try to negotiate uh, internationally, is very important. Uh, the link to the US um, is, uh, is important in that context as, uh, as well. And there has to be some really uh, creative multilateral thinking uh, as to the challenges that are coming uh, that, are, that are coming forward. So the internet can be a force of, of good as well. It can counter uh, authoritarianism as it emerges through its soft power capability on reputational issues. Look at Belarus, for example, or indeed uh, China's reputation is, uh, is suffering because of what it has done, not just the Michaels, but in other very aggressive um, foreign policy terms. So uh, I think uh, it's... Uh, it's a huge uh, issue, uh, and I don't think uh, the world is really ready for it. And the uh, the international norms that have been set out have been thus far uh, weak. And, and when you have uh, big tech in itself determining uh, who can be on Twitter and uh, and who can't, uh, that to me sets up uh, sends up a red flag as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask whether the other two panelists want to weigh in or do we move to another question? Have you got something you move? Yeah? Uh, Professor Sharon, you want to say something? I, I, I would just raise two sort of related issues that I don't think we give enough attention to is, is one of the um, endearing themes of populism, authoritarianism, um, but uh, great power competition is corruption. Corruption is on the rise everywhere, especially in Canada. And so the first thing we have to do is recognize that we are not perfect, that we have some deep challenges ahead. We don't have a registry of beneficial uh, ownership, for example. Uh, we've had uh, public 
uh, individuals who have been who have you know obviously engaged in corruption. Um, I, as an academic, am dismayed at how difficult it is to find information on government websites that's it's just kind of disappearing. Uh, things like a tip requests are taking longer and longer. So if we are going to tackle the big issues of authoritarianism elsewhere, we got to start here at home with things like uh, lack of transparency and corruption. The other thing is we need to totally rethink the one coercive weapon that we think we have, which is sanctions, which is really just jester sanctions. We have this justice for victims of corrupt foreign officials. We don't tell the individuals they've been targeted. Uh, we only apply, this is what we call the Magnitsky. We don't really align ourselves with the US and Europe. We only apply an asset ban, but not a travel ban. Uh, it was quickly put together 2022 it needs to be uh, rethought along with the Special Economic Measures Act, for example, maybe let's put sanctions in the title. But we are very good at often doing gesture moves that speak well to allies, uh, but are actually not achieving the objectives we want. Okay, thank you. Actually, Professor Paris, I'm gonna start you off as first on the next question. Okay. Does that sound okay? Sure. Um, I don't know what I'm buying, but I'll have it. <laughs> Wait till you find out. Mm -hmm. No, it says, the question is, why do we forget the Afghan immediately? Do we advance any of our values, such as democracy, freedom, and human rights? Do we advance any of our national interests? If we never reflect what our foreign policy has accomplished or failed, I don't see how we can improve our foreign policy. So to project our foreign policy in the future, we have to reflect our foreign policy in the past. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I'm just wondering if you could reflect on that question. And I think it's about the assessment of what we achieve with various foreign policies or whether we just move on to, the, to whatever the next challenge is. Yeah, it's a really good question actually. And I'm not sure that whether we as a country have really reflected on what our experience was there, even though our combat operations ended in 2011 and the last uh, Canadian troops before this uh, most recent evacuation were gone by 2014. Um, it, it was a, you know, it, this painful combination of great professionalism on the part of our officials and military doing a very, very difficult job for the most part. Of course, there were, there were small exceptions, um, combined with participation in a larger effort, which has to be said, ultimately failed. Yes, it uh, evicted Al-Qaeda for the most part from the country and, and uh, reduced Al-Qaeda as a, as a political entity. Uh, but as the goals of the Afghanistan mission um, expanded over time, um, almost all of those goals became difficult to sustain. And that's what is so worrying about the situation now is that we are in effect, um, you know, leaving behind not just those individuals who uh, helped uh, Canadian forces and Canadian government personnel, uh, although hopefully more and more of those people will be able to leave uh, uh, the country one way or another, but that we are not, no longer in a position really to defend um, the, the many people uh, who, the, a generation of Afghans who grew up in a, in a relatively open society. Uh, with women having the opportunity to pursue co-educational uh, education and participate fully in the society professionally and politically uh, with, a, with a dynamic, um, uh, you know, largely open uh, media, that that promise is very much at risk. And it's a painful thing to consider. And because it's painful to consider it, we may be inclined to kind of turn away from it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's important reflection needed here about how much we can realistically hope to accomplish in that kind of a situation. 
Did we bite off more than we could chew? Did we allow ourselves to bite off more than we could chew? Were we honest with ourselves through this whole period about what was happening on the ground and what the prospects uh, were? Um, and uh, now having said all that, you know, I don't think the situation in Afghanistan is hopeless. I think that the, the jury is still out. And I also would resist the temptation that I think that you see even to some extent in the Biden administration and even from Joe Biden himself to kind of turn away from something called nation building, which, uh, you know, in its extreme form at the barrel of a gun surely is a bad idea. But what does that capture? I mean, we've been the, there have been there were troops in Bosnia after that country's war for decades, and it's been relatively at peace that whole time. There's still U.S. troops in South Korea after all this time. So what are the limits of this new pr of proscribed behavior? So, so, you know, this is a complicated discussion. I'm not offering answers, but it's ways that we could act, get into this discussion and think about implications for Canada. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it is an interesting question about reflecting on what we've done. Um, I will ask uh, if other any of the other panelists have something that they urgently want to add to this, or should we move on? You can just raise your hand. No. Okay, we're moving on then. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what are the main challenges for Canadian foreign policy when it comes to minimizing the effects of climate change, given that the largest polluters right now, the US and China, are not on good terms, and the large numbers of climate migrants projected to be created by changing geography, I guess, and changing climate? So uh, let me just repeat at the top. So what are the main challenges for Canadian foreign policy on this issue? And climate change, I know everyone has mentioned it sort of a bit, but this might be a good time to get into it a bit further. I'm gonna ask for a panelist volunteer on this. Who would like to go first on climate change? Okay, uh, Professor Sharon, start with you. Well, I, I, I think, uh, and this is gonna sound just, Bear with me here. It, climate change is actually an opportunity for all of the countries to come together because I think we're finally seeing, especially China and the United States uh, and Canada are finally seeing how important dealing with climate change is. I mean, the clarion calls for action could not get any more loud or urgent. And this seems to be one area where we see China and the US can start to engage in a conversation. And it brings up another question on the Arctic Council. Um, you know, one of the great successes of great power politics has been the Arctic Council, which has two mandates, and that's environmental protection and sustainable development. And so when you can see the urgent need to work and cooperate together, and you start with low hanging fruit, um, you can actually get some great successes. And, and I would say the Arctic Council is one of them. And uh, China and the United States realizing that that climate change is an issue for them. So it's it's a start, perhaps. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Beam. If, if I could uh, add to that, I think uh, the COP meeting coming up in uh, in Glasgow will be very, very important. Uh, this uh, meeting has traditionally been the largest in the world of any any kind. It won't be because of COVID this time, but increasingly there are other actors who are uh, or who are playing a role. And I'm thinking in particular of the private sector, where in some cases corporations are well ahead of what uh, governments would want them to do, and they're already planning uh, into the future. Uh, so that's uh, that's one. And of course, setting out uh, targets that you uh, you feel you can you can hit which has been an issue in the election campaign here is, uh, is important because you can also lead by example. So for a fossil fuel producing country like Canada, this is of course not the easiest uh, thing to do, but if you could look at some of the Europeans, I'm thinking particularly in the, in the case of Germany where they have uh, made uh, significant commitments, they're still burning coal, 
uh, significantly, but uh, their levels are going down. Now, geographically, that's small. We are huge. Uh, and as, uh, as Professor Chardon said, uh, we have the Arctic uh, to consider. So that is a point for discussion. The US also has a part of the, the Arctic in, uh, in Alaska. Uh, China is increasingly interested in the Arctic Council uh, and in the Arctic for both uh, strategic and I think resource exploitive um, uh, reasons. But, uh, but nonetheless, there's work uh, to do there. And of course, civil society uh, means, uh, ma means, uh, maintains a very uh, engaged presence on all of these, uh, these files. So I think this upcoming meeting is going to be important. And if we look back at other uh, COP meetings that have taken place over the years, there always seemed to be a, a collapse um, uh, coming, even at the very beginning at uh, Kyoto uh, and then uh, at, at Copenhagen uh, and of course in, uh, in Paris. Uh, as well. So um, there's a lot of work, uh, work to do, and I think there are dedicated people working, uh, working on this. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to ask all of you this, I think, although you can pass if you don't uh, want to answer, but uh, we've not had, this is another question that's come up, we've not had a comprehensive foreign policy review for the longest time. Some argue that this translates into pragmatic latitude, but others, including myself, think that this renders our foreign policy too malleable and too exposed to political ebbs and flows, which is interesting. So uh, Professor Paris, I think I'll start with you because I suspect you have firm ideas on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you that when Justin Trudeau was elected, at that time I was advising him, and part of my advice was not to begin with a foreign policy review. Part of my thinking at the time, and, and this was, I mean, the, I was not the only one offering this advice, I should say, uh, but part of my thinking at the time was based on my experience uh, within the foreign ministry and then within the Privy Council office uh, two different jobs that I had during the period of the 2004-05 uh, foreign policy review that uh, Paul, the Paul Martin government had initiated. And, uh, and Peter will, will remember these days, that was oh, yes. a very difficult, pardon? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that was, um, that was, from my perspective, although I was observing it within government rather than being directly engaged in it, that was an extremely difficult process and very time consuming. And, uh, and in the end, I'm not sure whether it yielded a very good product. And certainly it was rendered immediately out of date by the fact that Paul Martin lost government. So my thinking was, let's take all these energies that could be devoted to a foreign policy review and do the foreign policy. On reflection, I think maybe we should have had a foreign policy review. And I think that there is a case for one now. I totally understand the hesitation on the part of, of, of some people, including who may think that this would end up being a uh, a, a overly burdensome uh, exercise that it may be uh, too vague or too general and not specific enough. Um, you know that the world is changing so quickly that the that by the time a foreign policy review is produced, it'll all be out of date. I hear, I understand all of those concerns, but um, there are moments when circumstances are changing so significantly that it it's worth taking the time to reflect on you know, how things connect to each other. And there have been really important reports written in this country's past, lots of foreign policy reviews, most of them not that important, but some, including indirectly the McDonald Commission report in the 1980s that led to the proposal that, that Brian Mulroney picked up for free trade with the United States and, and others. And other countries, this is my the point that I would offer to anybody saying, why should Canada bother with a foreign policy review? This is what pointy-headed academics are calling for, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't seem to stop our peer countries from doing it themselves because they see that it's in their interest to do it. The United States does these kind of policy statements all the time. Britain just is issued an integrated review. Uh, the Germans just came out with a, a, a policy paper on a German strategy on multilateralism. Uh, it could be a very good discipline, I think, just to get people thinking about these things. But I see Peter's gonna, going to have a, he has a droit de réplique. 
<laughs> That's true. But first, I'm just going to ask Professor Mamani uh, to weigh in. And we're, we're getting very close to the end here. So if everybody could just be brief about whether the, it's necessary or not. Yes, it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> That's very brief. OK. <laughs> um, fine, we'll go on to uh, Senator Bean. Have you got a, a brief response okay. about whether yeah, I, I don't I, I don't think it's uh, it's necessary having been involved in a number of foreign policy reviews and to paraphrase T.S. Eliot, we will continue all of our exploring and at the end of our exploring come to the place where we started and know it for the very first time. Every policy review has indicated that everything is important. Um, I was front and center involved in the international uh, policy review on aid and development that led to the feminist international assistance policy. I thought it's pretty good, pretty good policy. But I think what is required, especially with a pandemic, is something that is a little bit different, and that is whether what we are doing internationally is fit for purpose. There has not been a study on the conditions of foreign service in three generations. Um, we have 174 points of service all across the world. Uh, we've learned to work in uh, virtual ways uh, such, as, uh, such as this. How are we doing this? And will the pandemic change the way that we work? I think that has to be a really uh, important, uh, important uh, factor. And I reflect also on what other countries have done, and Roland has, uh, has mentioned this. You know, Norway indicated its interest in running for the Security Council, uh, which it ultimately won in 2004. We can't seem to get a bipartisan view on whether we should do it or not. And, uh, and I think that is something that has to mature within our political system. So before rushing into a, a foreign policy review, and not necessarily knowing where it's going to go, but we'll tick all of the boxes. I think we have to give a very hard look as to how we operate uh, abroad and how we develop policy. Okay, thank you. That's a, a, a good thought. And uh, Professor Sharon, you get the last word. Okay, so I'll make it brief, but I would do a hybrid. I think we need tiger teams in the public service that project forward. We know what's coming to bite us. You know, if we uh, get e-currencies and China is, is going to be the first, that is going to fundamentally change how the world operates. We should be ahead of this. How is this going to affect Canada? What should we be doing? Climate change, 50% of uh, our emissions by the Canadian Armed Forces is at home. This is just going to increase. Is this uh, sustainable? Should we be doing something differently? Uh, we know these kind of issues are coming at us. Um, when I was at the Privy Council office, we had Y2K. It was the one thing that kind of got us organized and going and rowing in one direction. We know those issues are coming at us. We need to get out in front with a, a public service that is uh, less stuck in its tracks, that can think creatively and come out ahead and say, let's brainstorm these things before it's raining down on us. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to do a lightning round here. This last one, we've got one minute left. I just want to ask everyone if you've seen anything on your radar we haven't talked about you think that might come in and bite us. And uh, Professor Mamani, I'll start with you. Oh, just boy. one or two words here. <laughs> well, I mean, we, I mean, Andrea's talked about cyber. I mean, it's not that we haven't discussed it, but it's, it's a huge. I think there's a lot to be said here. It is the new frontier of war. It's the way things are going to go in the future. It's cheaper, doesn't require the labor power as it's increasingly more difficult to recruit into an army. And it has high plausible deniability. I mean, it's the, the perfect storm for as a tool. Uh, we need to talk about it more. We need to invest in it more. Um, and we need to be more defensive uh, when it comes to the cyber attacks before us. Um, they're happening all day, uh, often without, uh, without us noticing sometimes. But, you know, clearly it's moved into the kinetic as well. We're seeing, you know, the shutdown of gas uh, pipelines and so forth. It's huge. And we don't invest enough of it in our defense of that. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, the other panelists, I'm just going to ask you, do you have like a brief answer of something that's on your radar we haven't talked about? It Taiwan, that's it. Taiwan, great. Okay. <laughs> Senator B? I'm still processing the concept of tiger teams in the public service, but that's that's okay. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> it's a great suggestion. Okay. I um, 
Uh, I'm concerned about the erosion of the multilateral system, and it's a and it's a a slow erosion from uh, from inside uh, in terms of how heads of uh, agencies are uh, are hired, and uh, some of the work that is being done by certain malign state actors to weaken those uh, those structures. And I think it's uh, it gets technical, but I think over time it's going to be a problem for us and for many other countries. Okay, thank you. And Professor Sharon, literally a one word or Yeah, if 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 there's some sort of either uh, attack in space that takes out GPS satellites and we can't use our cards to go and buy, I mean, look at the near chaos when people couldn't buy toilet paper. Can you imagine when everything shuts down? Uh, right. And this can happen by debris or this can happen um, because of nefarious uh, activity. But we need to have those redundancies so we are not shut down completely. Okay, thank you. You've given us something new, new to worry about in addition to everything else. We have come to the end of our time. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, participants. I did my best. And I would really like to thank all the panelists for giving your time, your expertise, your knowledge. It was a very interesting discussion. So thank you very much.